Third, in respect of the impeders, what are they but men, and wicked men, as ye may see in the adversaries of the Jews? Who are they that impede our work? Even men that seek honor and preferment of this world, enemies to religion, fighting against God, to whom I may say that word in Job, quote, who hath hardened himself against God and prospered, unquote. With one word more I will reprove this mountain and go forward, quote, who art thou, O great mountain, unquote. Wilt thou search thyself who thou art? Art thou of God's building or not? I trow you are not juris divinum, but human eye. God, nor Christ, hath never built thee. Thou art only a hill of man's erecting. Knowest thou not that Zion, against which thou art, is a hill of God's building? I will say to you then that word, quote, The hill of God is a high hill, as the hill of Bashan. Why leap ye hills? This is the hill that God desireth to dwell in, yea, and will dwell in it for ever. And I think ye to prevail against the pe excuse me, and think ye to prevail against the people of Zion? She hath stronger mountains to guard her than ye have. Quote, As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth and for ever. Number three, the third thing in this mountain is it is a mountain removed. Quote, thou shalt become a plain, unquote. That is, God shall remove all impediments before Zerubbabel and his people. God is able to remove all that impedes his work, even the mightiest enemies that oppose themselves to the work of God. Ye may observe a fourfold power of God against these mountains. First, a determining power, whereby he sets such bounds to the greatest mountains, that ye see they fall not upon the valleys, albeit they overtop them. The Lord hath set bounds to the great kings in the world, which they could not pass, when they have set themselves against the Lord's people. We may see an example of this in Sennacherib. Quote, Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come to this city, nor shoot an arrow against it, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it. Unquote. Ye are afraid of the king, that he come against you. Fear not. The Lord by his restraining power is able to keep him back, that he shall not so much shoot uh, sh that he shall not shoot so much as a bullet against this city number 2 god removes impediments by his assisting power as he promises to do before cyrus quote, i will go before thee and make the crooked places straight i will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the iron bars unquote. albeit for anything we see there be brazen gates and iron bars closing out a reformation yet let not this discourage you God is with you by his assisting power to go before you, to make all crooked places straight, and to break the brazen gates, and to cut in sunder the iron bars. Number three. God hath a changing power, whereby he makes mountains plain. How easy is it with God to make the highest mountain that impedes his work a plain? Quote, the king's heart is in the Lord's hand as the rivers of water, to turn it whithersoever he will. Unquote. Lord, make our mountains thus plain. The fourth way how God removes mountains is by an overthrowing power. If there be no change yet, God will bring it down. Quote, Everyone that is lifted up shall be brought low. Unquote. By this which hath been said, ye may understand how a mountain may be made plain. God makes mountains plains either in mercy or in wrath. Number one, in mercy. When he takes a grip of the heart and of a proud, haughty heart, makes it toward and plain, we have seen such a change by experience. This work had made, excuse me, this work had many enemies at the beginning that impeded it, whom God hath taken by the heart and made plain. Yea, he hath made them furtherers of the work. Number two, there is another way of making mountains plain, to wit, making plain in wrath, when God overthrows the mountains that stand up impeding his work. Assure yourselves, if God bring not down this mountain, we have to do with in mercy. He shall overthrow it in wrath and make it waste, that I may make this mountain more plain. You shall consider how it shall become a plain, and how easily it may be made a plain. Number one, I see you looking up to the height of it, and you are saying within yourselves, How shall it come down? You must not think that it will come down of its own accord. God useth instruments to pull down. I find that God hath made his own people instruments to pull down such mountains. Quote, Fear not, worm Jacob, ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Holy One, and thy Redeemer. Behold, I will make thee a new threshing instrument having teeth. 
Thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small, and shalt make the hills as chaff. Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them." Unquote. Mark these words. Although Jacob be a worm, despised by the great ones of the world, yet God will make him a threshing instrument to beat these mountains in pieces. The professors of this land are despised by the mountains. Yet fear not, for the sharp threshing instrument is made. I hope it shall beat the mountains in pieces. We think them very high, but if we had faith, that word would be verified. Quote, ye shall say to this mountain, Remove ye yonder, and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. But one is saying, I have not faith, that all that are joined this day against the mountain shall continue. I hope they shall continue, I hope they shall. But if they do not, we trust not in men, that they shall bring down this mountain, but in God, who hath said, quote, Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain. I will stretch out my hand upon thee. I will roll thee down from the rocks, and make thee a burnt mountain. They shall not take of thee a stone for a corner, nor a foundation. Thou shalt be desolate forever, unquote. This mountain ye see so exalted, although men would hold it up, yet God will bring it down and make it a burnt mountain. Even so, O Lord, do. Number two. In the second place, consider how this mountain may be made a plain. I told you it was but an artificial mountain, a studded mountain, standing upon weak pillars. If you would take a look of the whole frame of the mountain, it stands upon two main pillars, and upon the top of the mountain stands the house of Dagon, and house of false worship. And take me the pillars from Episcopacy, and it shall fall. Take Episcopacy away, and the house of Dagon shall fall. The two main pillars that prelacy stands on are a civil and secular arm, and an ecclesiastical tongue, so to speak. Number one, the secular arm is the authority of princes, which have ever upholden that mountain. Ye know secular princes uphold Antichrist, and prelacy in this land is upholden. Excuse me, ye know secular princes uphold Antichrist, and prelacy in this land is upholden by the secular power. Number two, the second pillar I call ecclesiastical, that is, prelacy in this land hath been upholden by the tongues of Kirkman, preaching up this mountain, or by their pens writing up this mountain. And these are the two pillars whereupon our mountain of prelacy is studded, the secular power and the tongues of Kirkman. Let the king withdraw his power and authority from the prelates, and they shall fall suddenly in dross. Let Kirkman and ministers withdraw their tongues and pens from them, and our mountain, ere ye look about you, shall become a plain. As these two stoot up this mountain, so upon this mountain all false worship in the kirk is built, even Dagon's house. Quote, Lead me, says Samson, to the pillars that Dagon's house stands on, that I may be avenged for my two eyes. Unquote. The Philistines were never more cruel to Samson in putting out his eyes than our prelates would have been to us. They pressed to put out our eyes, and ere ever we were aware they thought to lead us to Dagon's house, even to the tents of popery and idolatry. Let us come to this main pillar of Dagon's house, and apply all our strength to pull it down, that we may not only be avenged for our eyes, which they have thought to pull out, but also that the house of false worship which is erected upon this mountain may fall to the ground. I hear some say, Minister, for all you are saying, the mountain will not come down at this time. Ye think nothing, but it will come down. I assure you, I would have it down, but ye must not think us that silly as to think it will come down because we have many for us. We trust not in men, but in God. And if this be the time that God will have it down, although ye should lay all your hands above your he above their head, excuse me, although ye shall lay all your hands about their head, they shall come down. It appears they will come down if there were no more but their pride avarice, cruelty, and loose living to pull them down, especially when all these are come to height, as they are come to it in them. And so much for the mountain, ye see we have reproved it. God, remove it. I come now to the three in the work. The mountain being removed, number one, it is a work, growing and going up, quote, he shall bring forth, unquote. It is a work finished, quote, he shall bring forth the headstone thereof, unquote. Number three, it is a work praised, quote, He shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shouting, crying, Grace, grace, be unto it, unquote. We shall speak of all these three shortly. Number one, it is a work going up. It was impeded, but now it is going up. There is something here very considerable. The work goes not up until the mountain be made a plain. 
The mountain must not be pared or topped, but it must altogether become plain, otherwise the work cannot go up. The mountain of prelacy must not be pared or topped, something taken away, but it must be brought down wholly, otherwise the work of reformation cannot go on, neither Christ's house go up. It will be said, What ails you? You shall have your desires, but the estates of bishops must stand. It is impossible to bring it down altogether. The king may not want an estate, truly a good one, both to Kirk and Commonwealth. Ye shall have them brought within the old bounds, and caveats set down to them. They shall not hurt the Kirk any more. The Lord knows how loath I was to speak from this place. But seeing God hath thrust me out, I must speak the truth. I say to you, these quarters are not to be taken, because the mountain is not of God's making, but of man's. Therefore make it what ye will. God will be displeased with it. Yea, it is impossible to set caveats to keep them. I appeal to all your consciences. Is it possible to set caveats to their pride and avarice? Their pride and avarice will break through ten thousand caveats. I will clear this impossibility by similitudes. Tell me, if a fountain in the town of Edinburgh were poisoned, whether were it more safe to stop up the fountain than to set guard to keep it that none draw out of it, for there is hope the poison would do no harm? There is no man of sound judgment, but he will think it more safe to stop up the fountain than to guard it. This prelacy is the poisoned fountain, wherefrom the kirk of Christ hath been poisoned with the poison of error and, super and superstition. Now the question is, whether it be safer to stop it up than to guard it. Surely it is safer to stop it up, for all the caveats in the world will not keep the kirk unpoisoned so long as it remains. I will give you another similitude. If the town of Edinburgh were, as many towns have been and are, taken and possessed by cruel and obstinate enemies, who would take all your liberties from you, would not suffer your magistrates to judge, and would spoil you of your goods, and use all the cruelty that could be devised against the inhabitants? If God give you occasion to be free of such a cruel and obstinate enemy, what would you do if this were proposed to you? Why may not you... Excuse me, why may not you suffer the enemies to abide within the town? We shall take all their weapons from them. They shall never hurt you any more. Would you not think it far better to put them out of the town altogether, both because the inhabitants would be in fear so long as they were in the town, and because the town would never be sure? For there might be traitors among yourselves who would steal the weapons in their hands and so would bring you under the former tyranny, yea, under a greater. Even so it is in this case. The cruelest and greatest enemies that ever the Kirk of Scotland saw are those prelates. They have spoiled us of all our liberties and exercised intolerable tyranny over us. Now the Lord is showing a way how to be quit of them. Consider the condition offered. What ails you? May ye not let them abide within the Kirk? We shall take all their weapons from them as admission of ministers, excommunication, and that terrible high commission, they shall never hurt you again. This is but the counsel of man. The counsel of God is to put them out of the kirk altogether. Otherwise, the kirk can never be secure. Yea, I assure you, there are as many traitors among ourselves as would steal in the weapons again in their hands. Then shall our latter estate be worse than our first. If our yoke be heavy under them now, it shall be heavier then, if they chastise us now with whips." They shall chastise us then with scorpions. I think I hear men speak like that word, quote, Hew down the tree, cut down his branches, shake off his leaves, scatter his fruits. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots with a band of iron and brass, unquote. The interpretation of that part of the vision is set down in the 26th verse, quote, Thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee, after thou hast known that the heavens bear rule, unquote. I hear men say, Hew down the tree, Cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, scatter his fruits. You shall be quit of all that. But the stump must be left banded with iron. If it were till they knew God, it were something. But there is no appearance of that. Consider, O man, who saith that? Quote, no man but the watcher and the holy one, even he that made Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom sure to him. Unquote. If God hath made, excuse me, if God had made this estate sure to them, it would and should stand, and if God would bind down the stump of it with iron bands, we would never fear the growth of it, nor the fruit of it. 
But seeing they are only bounds to be laid on by men, albeit the tree were hewed down, it would grow again in all the branches of it, with all the leaves of its dignity, and we should taste of the bitter fruit of it. Ye that are covenanters, be not deceived. If ye leave so much as a hillock of this mountain, in despite of your hearts, it shall grow to a high mountain, which shall fill both kirk and commonwealth. If the kirk would be quit of the troubles of it, and if ye would have this work of reformation going up, this mountain must be made a plain altogether. Otherwise the Spirit of God saith, Ye shall never prosper.